On October 12, 1758, Nova Scotia Governor Charles Lawrence issued a proclamation to the people of New England, inviting them to settle the fertile Nova Scotian farmland that had been vacant since the expulsion of the Acadians. Agents representing potential settlers began pouring into Nova Scotia the following year, and in 1760 the immigration began in earnest. Within eight years, approximately 8,000 New Englanders had made the move to Nova Scotia and it was permanently transformed. One of these New England planters, as they were called, was Reverend John Seacombe. He was educated at Harvard University and came to Nova Scotia from Boston in 1761. He was accompanied by Captain Timothy Houghton and Robert Melvin. Seacombe and Melvin would eventually own lots on Oak Island. Seacombe was famous for his father Abbey's will, which was a very popular poem in both the American colonies and England. Seacombe would be accused of sedition in supporting the rebel cause in the American Revolution, as were two of his close associates, Captain Timothy Houghton and Malachi Salter. Houghton founded Chester, Nova Scotia, along with Seacombe, and was a town administrator. During the French and Indian War, Houghton served on the Eastern Frontier in Colonel John Winslow's regiment. In the Crown Point Expedition in 1755, he was an adjutant in Colonel Samuel Willard's regiment. In 1756, Houghton was under Colonel Jonathan Bagley's command and led a large company recruited from Massachusetts. While serving in the militia, Captain Houghton saw Nova Scotia for the first time and would obtain 100,000 acres of land for himself and 52 others, and they settled at Chester at Mahone Bay. At the start of the Revolutionary War, Houghton was involved in the siege of Fort Cumberland. Houghton was Chief Magistrate and Justice of the Peace for Chester and was jailed for sedition because of his activities. He was accused of helping American privateer prisoners escape back to Boston. History records that his trial was the most important court proceeding against a New England planter patriot in Nova Scotia. One of his four accusers was John Umlock of the Royal Nova Scotia Volunteer Regiment. Houghton's trial was only one of two in the province that were successfully prosecuted. He was jailed for a time and later died of smallpox. Malachi Salter was a very successful businessman who was very well acquainted with Reverend Seacum. He had operated a successful Boston distillery and was the senior partner in a firm involved in the fisheries and the West Indies trade. He relocated to Halifax, Nova Scotia during the founding of Halifax and engaged in shipping ventures which brought him both North American and European goods. He also worked on extending credit, prosecuting debts, and settling estates. In 1754, Salter expanded his operations into the field of government contracts. He was subsequently called upon to provide certain mercantile evaluations for the government. During the French and Indian War, Salter was owner of the privateer ship Lawrence, along with other Halifax entrepreneurs. He developed a sugar house at Halifax in the mid-1760s. The Sugar House and his American trade connections enabled him to capitalize upon the embargoes that had been placed on British goods by the American colonies in the late 1760s. Despite his various interests in further government contracts during the administration of Governor Michael Franklin, his fortunes continued to decline. In 1768, shipping and other losses were too much, and after two years of settling his debts in Nova Scotia and New England, he solely operated his sugar house. In 1773, he built a vessel at Liverpool, Nova Scotia, and returned to the sea as a trader. In 1776, Salter was sailing from London and was accused of intending English goods for Boston rather than their stated destination of Halifax. In 1777, he stood trial in Halifax for seditious conversation, but the jury found him innocent. Later the same year, his brig, Rising Sun, was captured by Salem privateers and condemned as a prize. As a prisoner in New England, Salter obtained a pass from the Massachusetts government to settle his family there. 
After his return to Halifax later in the year, he was accused of attempting to redeem Nova Scotian treasury funds for his Boston associates and was charged with secret correspondence of dangerous tendency with the rebels. Feeling harassed, he sailed for England where he remained, settling business affairs from early 1778 to early 1780. His absence delayed court proceedings against him, but from February 1778 until his death, charges of a misdemeanor continued from term to term. Reverend Seacombe was the spiritual leader in Chester and a prominent clergyman in Halifax. Seacombe delivered a famous sermon in Halifax that supported the elevation of Bruin Camingo, a German fisherman, as a reform minister for Lunenburg because ministers were very hard to find at the time. Reverend Seacombe and some of his congregation in Halifax would be charged with sedition during the American Revolution. The Nova Scotia Council charged Seacombe with preaching a seditious sermon that was seen as supporting the American Patriot cause. He was required to sign a formal recantation. However, there is no record of him having done so, but he is known to have preached in Halifax in June 1777. Seacombe was not prosecuted primarily due to his popularity. Reverend Seca maintained a diary journal of his early efforts in Chester and recorded important information. This diary is in the Nova Scotia archives and can be accessed today. His daughter Mercy also kept the diary, which is thought to be the earliest diary by a Nova Scotian woman and is held in very high regard. Mercy was also an avid watcher of the night sky and was well versed in astronomy. She recorded several astronomical observations. Seacombe owned Lot 7 on Oak Island, but quickly sold it to Robert Melvin in 1767. Captain James Anderson, another Oak Island lot owner, named his son after him, John Seacombe Anderson. Seacombe had his own island located very close to Oak Island called Seacombe's Island, where he lived until his death in 1792. According to Diana Muir's book, The Lost Templar Journals of Prince Henry Sinclair, Book 1, 1353 to 1395, it states, Prince Henry Sinclair said in his journals that the treasure was buried in two locations. One of those locations was recovered in 1770. The other treasure was left due to water. Henry Sinclair gave the latitude at 44.5131 north, which is 44.30.47.16 north latitude. Now, if you go by what Peter Amundsen's research with Shakespeare, you will notice he said the treasure was at Mercy Point. Well, if you go to Google Earth with the exact coordinates of Mercy, you will find on Google Earth that it is at 4430.47.16 North Latitude. To, to further verify this is the location of the treasure, Reverend John Seacombe knew where the treasures were on Oak Island, both of the treasures. Reverend John Seacombe, Brother John Frazier, and Brother Samuel Morris revealed to John Wemmis Sr. of Philadelphia in 1769. Seacombe's congregation of new settlers afforded him very little support, but with money he brought from New England, he developed a family farm. It is reported that his very necessitous circumstances changed in 1769 and were relieved by a family inheritance. Was a family inheritance the real reason for Seacombe's sudden change in circumstances? Who are John Wemyss Sr.? Samuel Morris, and John Frazier, and how did they factor into the Oak Island story? Was there a treasure recovered in 1770? Why did Seacombe sell his Oak Island lot to Robert Melvin so quickly? Was Oak Island being used for some hidden purpose during these years? How did the early lot owners play a role in this situation? What role did Oak Island play in the American Revolutionary War.
please join Quest of Oak Island Facebook group and subscribe to Quest of Oak Island podcast on YouTube for more information.